corruption, allegedly committed in 2012. He denies the charges. For the superstitious, Lula was jinxed from the onset. His party's number on the ballot is 13. Unlucky or not, Lula is almost certain to continue calling the shots in what's left of this campaign. Like in a play, he'll no longer be the lead actor, but rather the director behind the scenes, or in this case, behind bars. While he still has appeals to his sentence pending, time had run out to register an alternative candidate. Now, Haddad has less than a month to convince the electorate that he can indeed carry on the legacy of Lula, the former metal worker, remembered as the man who lifted more than 30 million Brazilians from poverty and social exclusion. Lula livre! Lucia Newman, Al Jazeera, Curitiba, Brazil. Tension in the South China Sea and the growing U.S.-China trade war are likely to top the agenda at a meeting of Asian leaders in Vietnam. The World Economic Forum talks will also look at how the growing workforce around Asia can compete as automation and artificial intelligence develop. Leading politicians from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations are due to attend. Almost a thousand people are in Hanoi for the event, and among them is Al Jazeera's Wayne Hay, who joins us now live from Hanoi. Wayne, what's the aim of this forum? Well, I think, as you mentioned, there will be much interest in uh, trade disputes, the uh, looming trade war between the United States and China. Uh, the countries in Southeast Asia very much potentially, anyway, caught up uh, in that uh, trade war, but also technology. The theme of this World Economic Forum on ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nations, is the fourth industrial revolution. So it's about new technologies, about artificial intelligence, about uh, cryptocurrencies, about 3D printing, about robotics, and how the countries in this region can uh, take advantage of those technological advancements and uh, to some extent be uh, at the forefront of them. Uh, combined, the Southeast Asian nations uh, make up a, a, well, are the fifth largest economy in the world, so clearly there are plenty of opportunities here, but challenges as well that can hold back some of that uh, economic uh, development, such as the promotion of democracy, human rights, freedom of speech. So while there will be this focus on business, as there always is, of course, at the World Economic Forum, not expecting there to be much focus, if any, on things like human rights and democracy. Most of it will centre around those new technologies, as I mentioned. Uh, Myanmar's Aung San Suu Kyi is there. She's involved in some public discussions with, uh, with other leaders. Uh, you talked about uh, human rights not really being on, on the agenda. Will, will at least the Rohingya uh, crisis be discussed? Yes, well, Aung San Suu Kyi, the state councillor, the leader of Myanmar, arrived just a few moments ago on the red carpet behind me. In fact, she was the last of the uh, leaders from the region to arrive. In a few minutes, she is going to take part in her first discussion, the first of three panel discussions that she's involved in. The first one is technology in Southeast Asia, where she's appearing alongside the likes of the Indonesian President Joko Widodo and the Vietnamese Prime Minister Nguyen Xuan Phuc. Uh, they will be focusing, uh, of course, going by the title of that discussion on technology, but the elephant in the room will be the situation in Rakhine State in Myanmar, the situation in Bangladesh surrounding the Rohingya. No, we're not expecting there to be much, if any, discussion around that issue, uh, despite the fact that this is really her first major public appearance, certainly overseas, since that damning United Nations report came out last month, which was very critical of her government uh, and the military leaders in Myanmar with the UN report saying that those military leaders had genocidal intent in their crackdown on the Rohingya and should indeed face charges. They were also critical of Aung San Suu Kyi and her government. So that very much will be the elephant in the room, I think, but not likely to see any discussion around it. Al Jazeera's Wayne Hay reporting live from Hanoi. Wayne, many thanks. More than 5.4 million people have been issued with storm warnings on the U.S. east coast as Hurricane Florence builds in the Atlantic. One and a half million have been ordered to leave their homes. Expected to be the worst storm in 30 years, it's likely to make landfall in North or South Carolina in the next two days. Forecasters are warning of winds of up to 240 kilometers an hour, flooding and coastal surges. President Donald Trump has already, already signed emergency declarations to free up federal funds for the response. Patty Culhane reports. It is huge. 
and it is powerful. This is Hurricane Florence, as seen from space, now tracking toward a direct hit on the coast of the Carolinas, prompting all kinds of warnings. She's a strong girl, and she is coming to see us. And I don't care what you do, you better get ready, because she's coming to see us. Officials are more specific, telling 1.5 million people along the Atlantic coast to get out, to evacuate to higher ground. Florence is intensifying steadily. This storm is strong, and it's getting stronger. It is expected to come ashore as a Category 4 hurricane with winds up to 225 kilometers per hour. Scary statistic, but likely not enough to make many leave their homes. There are always those who vow to stay behind and try to make it a festive occasion. Just getting gas. The UN Special Envoy to Syria has been holding talks with representatives from Turkey, Russia and Iran. Brazil's jailed former president, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, has been replaced as the Workers' Party candidate for next month's presidential election. The former mayor of Sao Paulo, Fernando Haddad, will take over. Lula says that he'll continue legal efforts to get on to the ballot paper. And leaders from Asian countries are in Vietnam for World Economic Forum talks. Tension in the South China Sea and the growing U.S.-China trade war are due to top the agenda in Hanoi. China's President Xi Jinping has met his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin in Vladivostok at the Eastern Economic Forum. The three-day summit is bringing together the leaders of Russia, China, Japan and South Korea. 5,000 delegates in total from 60 countries are expected. Rory Challens is in Vladivostok. With the slight awkwardness of two leaders who probably don't spend much time in the kitchen, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin conducted some pancake diplomacy in Vladivostok. The Chinese president is here for the Eastern Economic Forum and his third meeting with Putin this year. Despite the presence of other Asian leaders, it's Russia and China's strengthening ties that are the bedrock of this event. And with caviar and vodka, the two presidents were happy to let the world know how close they've become. We were constantly meeting this year, for example in Beijing, in Johannesburg, and now we are in Vladivostok. If we keep close contact with you, it means we have good relations. I am ready to strengthen these relations from now on, including the exchange of ideas through close cooperation. China has the largest delegation, with almost a thousand people. It is quite clear we have a really close cooperation. We had $87 billion of trade last year. This year, we will almost certainly reach $100 billion. The cooperation makes sense. The two Eurasian giants are next-door neighbors, and China's hungry economy needs natural resources, which Russia has in abundance. This growing relationship is about more than just the kind of business and energy deals on offer here at the Eastern Economic Forum. It's about the threats that both Russia and China feel they share in the modern world. While Xi Jinping and Putin were talking, the heavy metal of Russia's military was moving into place, China's too. It's been invited to take part in Vostok 2018, Russia's biggest war game since 1981. A sign of friendship and a message to one particular adversary. Clearly we can see uh, continued um, uh, rapprochement uh, between Russia and China because of uh, a very assertive line uh, of the United States. Uh, against both countries and in this regard we can we can um, uh, say that uh, Donald Trump uh, is the major patron of uh, Russian Chinese uh, uh, closer relationship Washington has imposed sanctions on Russia and trade tariffs on China each country is too independent minded to make a full alliance at all likely but they still want the US to know that if a regional crisis ever exploded into conflict Russia and China could present a united front. Rory Challens, Al Jazeera, Vladivostok. At least 32 people have been killed in a suicide bomb attack on a large crowd of protesters in Afghanistan. More than 100 others were injured in the blast near Jalalabad, the capital of Nangarhar province. The protesters had gathered to demand the resignation of a local police commander. This was just hours after a series of bombings in schools across Jalalabad. Nangarhar has seen a spate of ISIL attacks in recent months. The Taliban has denied involvement. Ugandan opposition politician Bobby Wine is calling on the United States to pull its support for the Ugandan military. In an interview with Al Jazeera, he said that he was tortured by the army after being arrested last month. Hibber Morgan reports. Sadly, 
Commission shares the concerns expressed in the report, in particular as regards fundamental rights, corruption, the treatment of Roma, and the independence of the judiciary. Orban says he's been unfairly targeted by a pro-migration liberal elite, but this Hungarian opposition MEP disagrees. In contradiction with um, um, what uh, Mr. Orban is saying, uh, this report is not about migration and refugees, but 95% of, uh, of this report is about uh, uh, undermining the fundamental rights of Hungarian citizens in Hungary. On Wednesday, MEPs will vote on whether to trigger Article 7 against Hungary. It's known here in EU circles as the nuclear option because of its seriousness. It's a procedure which could lead to Budapest being stripped of its EU Council voting rights. Orban's supporters say he's defending Hungary's sovereignty. His opponents say he's part of a populist wave that threatens the future of the bloc and must be reined in before European parliamentary elections next year. Natasha Butler, Al Jazeera, Strasbourg, France. Papua New Guinea has launched an emergency vaccination campaign in an effort to contain an outbreak of polio. Ten people have been diagnosed since June. The first case in the capital, Port Moresby, was confirmed last week. Most of the cases are young children living in remote areas. It's been 18 years since the disease was officially declared eradicated in Papua New Guinea. A medical emergency has been declared in Zimbabwe's capital after 20 people died of cholera there. It's reignited fears of a repeat of the outbreak that killed thousands in 2008. Haramatasa reports. Patients who are suspected of having cholera have been quarantined in Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. Health officials say this is an emergency. I realize that uh, the numbers are growing by the day, the number of cases. And to, to date, there are about 2,000, over 2,000 cases. The city of Harare has had a big problem. This whole problem is arisen as a result of blocked sewers. Zimbabwe's health sector, like other departments in the country, has been underfunded and poorly resourced for decades. Government officials blame the current economic crisis and say they lack resources. Opposition leaders say it's because of decades of corruption and mismanagement. Public hospitals sometimes run out of essential drugs. We have left our original... The Nobel laureate was the second African to serve as UN Secretary General. He died last month in Switzerland at the age of 80. Now, they were invented in Japan, where a complex alphabet made texting cumbersome. But in the past few years, emojis have become part of the way many of us communicate. Now they're being used in art exhibitions and in the fight against malaria. Do not adjust your set. You may have to watch with your head on the side, as Emma Haywood explains from London. A picture can paint a thousand words. Happy, thoughtful, even horrified. With one tap, there's a shortcut to human emotion, and emojis are now making it into the art world. At a new exhibition in London, artist Antoine Catala is exploring their impact on society. A video loop of a conversation and silicone emojis play out to show how a few words and symbols can change the way we talk, think and react. Written language is sort of fixed, but oral language changes over time. It's different means of transmission of information. And emojis, we don't know how they will look like in 10 years. However, the text will read the same. And so it's kind of interesting to think of it as some kind of archival form and how it would look in 10 years. More than 560 billion texts are reported to be sent worldwide every month. We've been sending text messages to one another for more than 25 years. They have totally transformed the way we communicate.